All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Here we're going to talk about cholesterol synthesis. Okay, so this is our pathway. It looks like a lot, but I promise you there's only a little bit of high-yield information uh, for this pathway. So we'll run through the whole thing, but uh, I'll point you towards the stuff that's really important for your exam. All right, so we start out with acetyl-CoA, obviously very important intermediate if you haven't figured that out by now. Uh, and then we add another acetyl-CoA, and this is a thiolase enzyme, and we get acetoacetyl-CoA. Acetoacetyl-CoA. And then this kind of happens again. Uh, so we add another acetyl-CoA. Of course, we're giving off CoA, and we did that last time as well. And what we get then is HMG. CoA. Now the enzyme that does this is called HMG-CoA synthase. And this is different from the next enzyme, which is extremely important. So what we do is we take HMG-CoA and we reduce it. So we go from HMG-CoA to mevalinate. Now, it's important to know the name of this enzyme is HMG-CoA reductase. We're reducing HMG-CoA. And uh, as we do this, we're obviously reducing, so we need something to do that reducing. And what is it? It's NADPH. So that's an important antioxidant and a reducing agent. And then of course, we're getting NADP out of that. Okay, so HMG-CoA reductase is very important pharmacologically because it is the target of the statin medications, which is uh, one of the most important drugs that we use in hypercholesterolemia to treat patients with high cholesterol. So statins directly inhibit HMG-CoA reductase. What else does it? Glucagon and cholesterol itself. And we'll see how that is on the next slide. Uh, there are some inductors of HMG-CoA reductase. Those are insulin, thyroxine, and estrogen. I've never seen an exam question that asks about that, uh, but I figured I'd just mention it. So mevalinate has five carbons. And what will then happen is mevalinate will get converted into IPP. And IPP uh, just stands for isopentanyl pyrophosphate. Don't need to know that. IPP then gets converted to DPP. These are both five carbon molecules. And then what happens is we start to get this condensation. So DPP and IPP, which also has five carbons, will get converted to GPP. GPP stands for geranyl pyrophosphate. And of course, this is going to have 10 carbons. And so what's going to happen then is you get another condensation with IPP coming in here with five carbons and you get FPP or farnesyl pyrophosphate. Now, this entire part here is not really important. Okay, so I just included it for completion's sake, but this is something here that is fairly important. Farnesyl pyrophosphate, which by the way has 15 carbons, is a precursor for coenzyme Q, which as you are probably aware, is involved in the electron transport chain. Now, if you're giving statin medications, you're going to reduce the amount of CoQ and thus you're going to possibly have some toxicity from that. And so this is why we give CoQ supplementation to patients with, uh, who are on statins. Now, there's disagreement as to whether that's actually um, effective or beneficial, uh, but it can't hurt. So we give CoQ uh, alongside statins in patients uh, who are on those drugs. Okay, so then we have that FPP. It condenses with another FPP. And we have another reduction that happens here. And so we're using NADPH. And we get NADP. And the product here is called squalene. 
Now, you've probably heard squalene before when we talk about antifungals. Now, this has 30 carbons. The enzyme that does this is not super important, but I will include it. It's called squalene synthase. Pretty easy name to remember. We're making squalene, squalene synthase. Okay, so squalene then gets converted to something called lanosterol. Lanosterol. And lanosterol in eukaryotic organisms will then get converted to 7 dehydrocholesterol. Now in fungi, lanosterol will get converted to ergosterol. And do you remember the name of the enzyme that does this? It's called 14-alpha-demethylase. Now this is important because one of the drugs that we use as an antifungal are the azole classes of antifungal, or azole class of antifungal. Okay, azoles. So the reason that we can use them in fungal infections and why they're beneficial is because it reduces the amount of ergosterol. And ergosterol you can think of as fungal cholesterol. And so it's, it's useful because you're not going to have toxicity on eukaryotic organisms, i.e. you, uh, because you're not blocking the production of cholesterol. You're blocking the production of ergosterol, and that only happens in fungi as far as we're concerned. So uh, this is why squalene and lanosterol and ergosterol are important to know. So this is... Uh, as we go from squalene down to cholesterol, it's pretty important. So you should be familiar with these steps. And I have a talk on antifungals and the pathway, uh, the biochemical pathway uh, and how they work. Uh, so you can go back and watch that video if you want. Now, 7-dehydrocholesterol can go in a couple directions. 7-dehydrocholesterol is a precursor for vitamin D. And 7-dehydrocholesterol also is a precursor for cholesterol. So we got to the end. Now, cholesterol is constituent on eukaryotic cell membranes. It's a precursor for steroid hormones. It's a precursor for bile acids. And it exists as cholesterol esters as well. All right, so this is the cholesterol synthesis pathway. The important things to know are HMG-CoA reductase, where that fits in, the fact that statins block it, and then I would know a thing or two about going from squalene to cholesterol, that in fungal cells, lanosterol goes to ergosterol through the enzyme 14-alpha-demethylase, and that azoles block that step. And then also that 7-dehydrocholesterol is the precursor for cholesterol and also the precursor for vitamin D. All right, now, uh, when you're talking about the regulation of cholesterol, what you're talking about really is the regulation of HMG-CoA reductase. HMG-CoA reductase, that reaction as we go from HMG-CoA to mevalinate, that is the rate-limiting step in cholesterol synthesis. So if we regulate that enzyme, we regulate cholesterol production. And in fact, we do regulate that enzyme at the transcriptional level. So what happens is HMG-CoA reductase uh, catalyzes the rate-limiting step, and ultimately you get cholesterol. Now, cholesterol within the cell regulates this, uh, this uh, steroid-reacting uh, binding protein, SREBP. Don't, don't worry about what that stands for. Just know the letters. Uh, so SREBP uh, exists as a regulator, and cholesterol inhibits it. So when cholesterol inhibits SREBP, it's bound to SCAP. Just think of cholesterol as inhibiting SREBP. That's it. Now, when there's low cholesterol, SREBP is unbound to that SCAP, and so it is able to enhance the transcription of this gene that codes for HMG-CoA reductase. So basically what the cell does is in the presence of cholesterol, we don't have that enhancer, 
And so we have less transcription of the gene that codes for HMG-CoA reductase. So high cholesterol, low HMG-CoA reductase. Low cholesterol, high HMG-CoA reductase. And that's good because if we have low cholesterol, we want to increase the amount of cholesterol biosynthesis. Now, this domain within the DNA also codes for LDL receptors, not just HMG-CoA reductase. So in addition to cholesterol biosynthesis through the transcription and translation of HMG-CoA reductase, we also increase the synthesis of the LDL receptors. And that's a good thing because if we have low cholesterol, and we increase the synthesis of LDL receptors, then we're going to pull more LDL uh, particles into the cells, and the result is that they're going to have they're they're going to get more cholesterol that way. So this whole process increases the amount of cholesterol biosynthesis and also increases the amount of cholesterol uptake. So this is the cell's ability to regulate cholesterol.